Welcome to Into Theology. We are back after a sort of unintentional break. We had a busy end of year, Ian and I. and uh, But we finally been able to get back together and we're here to discuss John Calvin's Institutes. We're in book three and we're gonna cover chapters eight through 11, which is basically two weeks of reading. And then we'll come back and next time and uh, work through chapters 12 and following. So basically- well, in this Let me just say before we start, I'll take the hit on this one too. I mean, you know, just with the end of term, tons of grading of papers, exams, and then going into Christmas, it was just like, uh, so thank you, Wyatt. And thank you, everybody. You know, one or two people that actually listened to us for actually- yeah. <laughs> One or two people, yeah. Uh, there's actually four, we know, four. we know for sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> my mother, I know that one for sure. <laughs> your mom, my mom, yeah. Uh, so the section that we're about to enter in is kind of an interesting one. Uh, Calvin is very focused on the idea of the mediator, Christ, and how we partake of the mediator by kind of union with him or spiritual union with him. In these sections, he begins by kind of talking about how uh, we can take comfort when we're afflicted because Christ likewise was afflicted. And so we can commune with the sufferings. And then he kind of begins to talk about the end of life, talks about the beatific vision and all these kinds of things. Uh, and he moves into this idea of justification by faith, which is important, of course. And he really, we'll get to it, but he really dives into this guy, once again, named Osiander, who kind of gets justification wrong. So as we kind of dive into this, I know, Ian, we had a section that we wanted to read. I don't know if you want to start there. And it's on page 725, chapter 11, in section one. Yeah, and, it's right, uh, right, right after that uh, first footnote that you see there under 11.1. Um, yeah, it's really like one of the things that I, I've noted over the years in terms of Calvin studies that there's been this like major reorientation in terms of understanding the Ordo Salutis um, and actually having a right reading of Calvin on this. So people like Richard Gaffin, uh, Sam Waldron did a PhD, like looking at Calvin and union with Christ. So the, the sort of standard way of understanding the Ordo Salutis is that there's like this logical progression of like, you know, uh, calling, regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification that seem to follow a an order. And what these other guys are proving is, and, and I think that we're seeing this right now in this whole section that we've had to read, is that really all those things all kind of flow out of union with Christ. And of course, mm -hmm. there's a logical order theologically, but they all are grounded fundamentally in union. Um, so yeah, I'll read this uh, right at the very bottom here of 725 and a little bit on to, on to uh, 726, where he talks about justification as a hinge. And then we can kind of just go from there. So um, on, uh, on 725, he says, let us sum these up, kind of what he's been saying. Uh, Christ was given to us by God's generosity uh, to be grasped and possessed by us in faith. By partaking of him, we principally receive a double grace, namely that being reconciled to God through Christ's blamelessness, uh, we may have in heaven instead of a judge, a gracious father. And secondly, that sanctified by Christ's spirit, we may cultivate blamelessness and purity of life. Of regeneration, indeed, the second of these gifts, I have said what seems sufficient. The theme of justification was therefore more lightly touched upon uh, because it was more to the point uh, to understand First, how little devoid of good works is the faith through which alone we obtain free righteousness by the mercy of God. And what is the nature of the good works of the saints with which part of this question is concerned? Therefore, we must now discuss these matters more thoroughly, and we must so discuss them as to bear in mind that this is the main hinge on which religion turns, so that we devote the greater attention and care to it. For unless you first of all grasp what your relationship to God is and the nature of his judgment concerning you, you have neither a foundation on which to establish your salvation, nor one on which to build piety towards God. But the need to know this will better appear from knowledge itself. Um, I mean, you, we could spend a whole lifetime just working through what he says here, you know, talking about how uh, Christ is the one who is given to us. Uh, because God is a generous God. He knows, no longer stands in relation to us as a judge, but now he stands in relation to us as a gracious father. Because of this, we have this double grace, which is this uh, was it reconciliation here, and then sanctification. Uh, and then he pulls, and he says, I've said a lot about this. I've talked about, you know, in the beginning of, of chapter, of book three, he talks a lot about what is regeneration and repentance. And now he's going to dive into what, with sort of like a similar kind of metaphor that he, he has with Luther, like in familiarity with Luther, the doctrine of which the church stands or falls here yeah. down, describing justification as like a hinge yeah. by which all of our religion swings upon as it were. So lots of stuff to go on here. 
it's interesting too. I mean, it might be worth just reminding people. <laughs> they may not have heard the earlier podcast, but like, when he talks about religion and piety, he has a very specific idea in mind. This idea of like liturgical worship towards God or service towards Him or obedience towards Him. Yeah. Whole the first thing you got to know is does God accept it? <laughs> I mean, that might be the yeah. simplest way to put it from this section. And uh, this is going to be, end up being very important um, for us. And I think he wants to define, I mean, I think there's some beautiful definitions here already. But one thing he does is he ties together, we call it justification and sanctification today. Yeah. But he's basically tying together those, those two realities. So that, that double grace, one on page 725, uh, that we are judged right. And then really second is regeneration. Um, or sanctification yeah. so regeneration for him is is not how we think of it typically today i would say it's well it's for more, him like in the beginning of yeah of, of uh of book three when he talks about regeneration we always think of it as this, a definitive moment that that's that's it's kind of like synonymous with new birth um he actually ties it to repentance and sees yeah. it as an ongoing process. It's a renewal of the whole life yeah. and it's something um, you commit yourself to as a daily repentance that's actually your regeneration right. I mean, and you talked about the Puritans earlier, but the Puritans get into this too. Like repentance is not an event. It's yeah. who you are. It's the way that you live your life. It's a daily thing. Yeah. And I think yeah, Kelvin can, kind well, of gets you can into do that. that. You can do that. Like we do it with, with sanctification, right? We Theologically now we talk about definitive, progressive, final sanctification. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a debate that Mark Jones, a uh, fellow Canadian of ours, uh, had uh, some time ago on Reformation 21, where it says actually the Reformed tradition does the same with justification. There isn't an initial justification, then right. there's an ongoing, and then a final justification. That oh, yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, it's we, funny we, when, you, when you read the actual Reformed writers, you realize there is a sort of collegial diversity, which is healthy and good yeah. on the way they talk about these things. The, the big picture is there. God calls us right, justifies us, the Holy Spirit changes us, but the way in which all it happens. Um, I, I just want to note one thing. Uh, but we can jump into the section. Before we get there, uh, I wanted to note that one where I, I think he's kind of hinting at the beatific vision and that's on page 716 yeah uh, book three uh chapter nine section four it talks about longing for the eternal life yeah and I, it might be maybe i overstated by saying for sure beatific vision but it's that I idea at least so a few sentences down from the first full paragraph he says it's interesting for if heaven is our homeland yeah what else is the earth but our place of exile Okay, I mean, we're exilic. I kind of can see that language. Okay, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. He continues. This not our home. We're only passing yeah. through. Bible words, right? Yeah. If departure from the world is entering to life, what else is the world but a sepulcher? Uh, <laughs> how do you pronounce that word? Sepulcher, man. Sepulcher. <laughs> but a sepulcher. And what else is it for us to remain in life but to be immersed in death? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if we to be freed from the body is to be released into perfect freedom, what else is the body but a prison? Yeah, well, <laughs> we, I mean, he said this before, like we've kind yeah. of this, right? Like we all, I think, want a healthy degree of Christian Platonism. Yeah. Uh, mediated through church fathers like Augustine and medievals like Aquinas. But boy, the body is a prison. It, it's an, in, it's, let's read the next sentence and talk about it. The next sentence is, if to enjoy the presence of God is the summit of happiness. So that's kind of that beatific language. Yeah, blessed. is not to be without this misery. Um, so, I mean, I think his idea is we're going to leave this kind of body behind, the soul sense of God. He for sure has the bodily resurrection there. It's yeah. not, out, I mean, I don't think we've got to that yet, but I mean, it's there, I'm, I'm sure, in Kelvin. But it is an interesting section. So now Paul talks about caring about, you know, the, uh, this the body of death upon us, how the flesh is viewed relatively negatively as, as having the power of sin in it. Yeah. Chapter seven of Romans, my, the mind battles the flesh. There's two, yeah. there's two laws there. Uh, and even in the section that we started with in chapter eight, he begins with the mind uh, in chapter eight in the very first sentence there in the section one. It says, but it behooves the godly mind yeah. to climb still higher to the height which Christ calls his disciples. And it's cross-bearing there. Yeah. But the mind for Calvin, I mean, even at the beginning of the, of the whole institute, is, is massive. The mind is the is the writer. It's the controller of the lower faculties. He has a yeah. faculty psychology, and the mind itself, I think, here is the thing that ascends from the negative body to see God. So there, there is a bit of Platonism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Intellectualism. Intellectualism, maybe, is a better way to put it. Uh, yeah, or both, really. Yeah. 
So anyways, I, but, but the one thing I like to say is that the summit of happiness is the presence of God. That is that traditional language of heaven. Yeah. Heaven is where God is. Heaven is a, what is Edward's sermon again? Heaven is a kingdom of heaven joy. Is world, or, heaven, heaven is a world of love. Is a world of love. Um, yeah. And so I actually think it's a very important thing. I, I don't know. I mean, there's different views about this, but I, I do think the presence of God, that vision of God really is the central thing. Yeah. And, I, you know, it might be earthly, there might be physicality to it, whatever, but that's the central thing. I think Kelvin it, gets it right. It'd be interesting to know. I mean, we have this as a translation as happiness here. It'd be interesting to know what he's originally, the word he's, yeah. originally, he's drawing from. It's probably the idea of blessedness, right? That's, um, the, yeah, the probably. State, uh, which is really the idea of like the human kind of fully coming into his own full human flourishing than just like you know happiness as like oh you know like the blue jays won and uh, i'm happy <laughs> you know like this is That's, this is yeah. the state of like of orderliness in the soul and a kind of unity with with the, the orderliness of nature kind of thing yeah i mean i do have the latin institutes open but it's so unlikely that i'll find it without being super awkward that i won't <laughs> uh <laughs> You could just like uh, we could pause and come back and you look like a yeah. Dude. I'll if there's a if there if you're like talking for a bit, I'll try to scan through to what is it oh, okay. three sections. Well, I mean, I can like we were talking about you know go back to on page seven twenty six again under uh, what he calls uh, the subheading is the concept of justification on number two, and there and at the end of that section he gives some helpful definitions of justification, and uh, again like this is all part of this broader picture of union with Christ. And, uh, and he describes justification. He says, um, it, he is said to be justified in God's sight, who is both reckoned righteous. So that's the language of imputation. Uh, so the idea of God crediting righteousness. Um, so he, so uh, who is both reckoned righteous in God's judgment and has been accepted on account of his righteousness. And so he'll say God is now no longer this like uh, angry judge with us, but rather now he's a, a gracious father. And then on top of uh, 727 there, uh, that last, uh, that last uh, paragraph, he says, therefore, we explain justification simply as the acceptance with which God receives us into his favor as righteous men. And we say that it consists in the remission of sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness. So the idea in justification is we've now been accepted, right? Yeah. Because we're in Christ. And uh, because of that, now we have his righteousness, which is credited to us. It's something outside of us, but um, that becomes really ours. And we have remission of sins, or we have the forgiveness of sins by which now we can relate to him properly. Um, while you were talking, I found the passage. Yeah. Uh, so it's the word is uh, felicitatis. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so, say prima felicitatis. So yeah. and it really is supreme felicity. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. Oh, it's, anyways. Uh, so it is that I think closer to the idea, not of happiness, how we think of it in terms of a, an emotional feeling, but yep. of that. Yeah. But true happiness really is uh, to be also justified, which you're getting at as well. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he's going to go on, right? Because he's he wants us to rightly understand how we relate to God, right? Like, how does this acceptance happen? And it seems like Osiander is probably getting enough credibility that calvin feels the need to have to respond to to this idea yeah. chapter of, 11 yeah of righteousness that that Os osiander's wanting to put forth right so calvin is going to want to affirm this this what you know where is it there was i remember uh we noted you noted it earlier before we started recording the idea of the mystical union yeah it, mystical it's union. union it's a union through the human christ 737 o is, is a osiander number. seems to want to say something beyond that doesn't he yeah so yeah, so maybe to kind of introduce Osiander as Calvin presents him. I haven't read Osiander. I'd be curious to if his, if his writings are available. Calvin basically presents Osiander as saying, look, justification and sanctification are kind of united. And the reason why is because you're actually given the righteousness, righteousness of God in terms of God's essential righteousness. Yeah. Now, for this to make sense, you really do, you do need to know the scholastic language. Because what is an essence? The essence is whatever God is. Yeah. And if you have whatever God is, as God is infused into us, well, that actually, it's really tricky. And it seems to imply that you are on par, on par with God, no. but uh, we're creatures. We're not the creator. And it yeah, seems to break the gap between the uncreated and created, the infinite and finite in a way that is improper. And Calvin rectifies that by showing the proper way that the finite and the and the infinite correlate and that's in christ the person of christ the mediator yeah um yeah. so it's really the, union with christ 
Right, a union with Christ that comes by way of the Holy Spirit, right? So it's a, the Spirit is the one who is bringing us into that union. And, uh, and so, but it's, it is, like, I think uh, you noted this too before. Page 730. Uh, yeah, where he was talking about, oh, yeah, there's the spiritual union there. He says, for we hold ourselves to be united with Christ by the secret power of his spirit. And then he says, we deny that Christ's essence is mixed with our own. Yeah. Uh, so he's trying to, and, he, and then he, and then he's critiquing Osiander on 731. He says he throws in a mixture of substances uh, by which God makes us part of himself. And so he doesn't like yeah. this idea. He wants to maintain the integrity of the two natures and he wants to maintain the integrity of the divine essence so that when we come, when we get that acceptation that comes through justification, it's actually coming through yeah. human nature of Christ. But doesn't he use sacramental language in this sense? Yes. But right, we'll get that. It's on page 736, I believe. But one pause. He used the word mixture of substances. Substances. Mm -hmm. He talks about the two natures of Christ. Right. What he's doing here, we have to just He's using patristic it. language, right? It's Chalcedonian syntax. Yeah. And he's accusing Osiander of saying, if God's essence comes into us, that mixes the human and divine natures together. But that's unacceptable. Even in Christ, the yeah. union of Christ. When I say union... Uh, uh, I mean salvation typically, but right now I mean the union of the of the divine and human nature of Christ. Yeah, on the and union that's unacceptable for those to mix. Yeah, and so his view of salvation actually mixes the two, and is outside of Chalcedonian Orthodox syntax for talking about how the finite and infinite correlate. Yeah. The only way that can happen, the only possible way that can happen, is in the mediator, the person of Christ. And uh, so on page seven thirty six, what you noted that sacramental analogy. It's really important. Um, he uses it to show, look, in the, the humanity of Christ, we see the hidden God. Yeah. Likewise, in the bread at the altar, or I guess they won't use an altar at this point, but yeah. at the bread at the table, yeah. uh, you see the hidden and incomprehensible God. Like that's the analogy. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to read that on 736, that yeah, yeah. area. Yeah, right after the quote there that's in square brackets for John 655, um, I'll read from there where he talks about a method. Uh, so he says, this method of teaching is perceived in the sacraments, even though they direct our faith to the whole Christ and not to a half Christ. I mean, that's awesome, right? Like in the sacraments, you get the whole Christ. Uh, he says, they teach that the matter both of righteousness and of salvation resides in his flesh, right? That's the important part in terms of his mediating work. Not that as mere man, he justifies or quickens by himself, but because it pleased God to reveal in the mediator what was hidden and person. incomprehensible. Sorry, yeah. what? So you, you, I was saying the mediator is for oh, him. I, the I you're correcting yeah. me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, but because it pleased God to reveal uh, in the mediator what was hidden and incomprehensible mm -hmm. in himself. So this incomprehensible God, right, which is this mm -hmm. fundamental problem we have is like, how do you know the incomprehensible God? Well, he has to actually make himself known to us to be able to do this. John and 1, was, no one has known God except for <laughs> yeah, only exactly. God is at his side and made him known. And so here you have now <clears throat> in human flesh. Yeah this revelation of God that was once hidden and incomprehensible right. has now been made known. I right. Mean, it's like, boom. And, and uh, you can see, actually, it confirms what I just said. Right below that talks about the person of the mediator. Yeah. So again, I got to clarify, that's Chalcedonia again. The person yeah. is where the two natures correlate in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. There's one person, two natures. Whatever is those two natures, the only way they connect, there's no mixture, there's no division. Yeah. They're perfectly united in the person. And so you have that again here, the person of the mediator gives us all of what God is. Yeah. And therefore, we, when we have a mystical union with him, as the next page will show in 737, we have all that God is in Christ, the mediator, in his human flesh, that sacramental flesh for our sake. And so it, it's not this kind of gross, straight up, we become God type of thing. Like that's not yeah. what we're, yeah. that's what he, I think he's accusing Osiander of basically saying. I'd be I'd be curious to know what Osiander's doctrine of God looked like. Yeah, um, the things like a divine simplicity, because like <laughs> the way the way Calvin is articulating this, that we we have this kind of like, if you want to use the old patristic language of like a deification, uh, it comes through the mediator in his flesh, uh, and so that doesn't have to change. Like we don't, which is interesting yep. when, Paul, when he's talking about the prison house of the body, which is flesh. Here yet we come to Christ in the flesh, which actually liberates. Yeah, uh, the, the flesh of Christ liberates us from our fallen flesh. 
Um, Which maybe watch. balances his his comments about our fallen flesh right. earlier, because the 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 glorified flesh of Christ is much better. But it, it helps then to maintain those certain you know the attributes of God. Um, you know, because either we would have to be utterly obliterated and completely subsumed into God and just completely lose the idea of ourselves, right. or something would have to happen in terms of God changing, um, which the attributes, uh, impassibility, simplicity, uh, eternality, all those things don't allow for. They don't, yeah. But because Christ is the mediator, we come in uh, to this acceptance with God through the flesh of the mediator. Mm. We receive all these things like justification, and everything else then all that integrity is maintained, right? It's, and it's odd to me that I don't think Calvin says it directly, you are making it sound like we become God as God. No. But he's definitely, definitely. implying it. And uh, it, it would be, so here's the thing, in polemics, you always know that when you attack someone, you're, you're picking the, the problem. So Oceander could be 95% awesome. Yeah. And then have this 5%, ugh. But it's so important because it's the hinge upon which religion turns. Yeah. The Kelvin is, I don't think vicious is the right word, um, strident. He's very well, he strident. Called, I, mean, I just caught him here. Uh, what page was it? I think where he, he described Osiander's view as slander. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Uh, he says, thus is Osiander's slander refuted that by us faith is reckoned righteousness. Because he thinks now what happens with Osiander, which is ironic because he's a Wittenberg trained Lutheran. Yeah. Um, that, that Osiander's lost the doctrine of justification. Because what do you need right. it for when you're brought into this kind of like real essential union through an essential righteousness of God instead of an imputed righteousness? So it's it's curious how Osiander kind of like sort of butchers this. But I'd, I'd like to talk to a Lutheran to yeah. like, find out exactly what, what Osiander was really dealing with here. And even on page 738, it says Osiander laughs at those who teach that to be justified is a legal term. So th there is something, there's some things going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, a legal term if you're Lutheran, it should be okay. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, it's a bit confusing. There's a couple things, um, or at least one thing I wanted to note before we moved on. Uh, at the bottom of page 730 and spilling into 731, uh, Calvin makes some really interesting statements. So he says, um, for this is the reason, at the bottom of page one th 730, yep. for this is the reason why he contends so vehemently that not only Christ, but also the Father and the Holy Spirit dwell in us. Although I admit this to be true, yet I say that it has been perversely twisted by Osiander. For he ought to have considered the manner of the indwelling, namely, that the Father and the Spirit are in Christ, the person. And even as the fullness of deity dwells in him, so in him we possess the fullness of deity. Yeah. And this is important. So we have a triune indwelling. Yeah. But it's only in the person, like, because we have Christ by yeah. spiritual union or, or the mystical union. Um, I think that's really important. So it's it's almost um, someone uh, has a book on something called Christiosis. <laughs> okay. And the idea is that we become like Christ. It's not. I mean, theosis is that word that maybe doesn't communicate accurately what we're trying to say. Because even yeah. Cyril of Alexandria, I think in his, um, I think it's his Christological Dialogues. He says we become uh, we're united to God by the Holy Spirit. Like it's through Christ's flesh. It's, they're pretty clear on this in the Fathers as well. Yeah. And so the language, um, anyways, the theos is confusing, but I think here it's really in the person of Christ and, and in no other way. And that, yeah. again, protects all the things that you said. It we, and it makes sense that to say this, right, in terms of, uh, you know, the church's notions of the kind of unified external operations of the Trinity. Yeah. Right? So they have like the, the, the one will of God terminates in the ad extra, you know, Trinitarian right. relations on certain persons um but when the one person's doing something the other two persons are there involved in it right so if if there's an indwelling in us yes we get that through the spirit but because of the unified external operations you get mm -hmm. the God, you know through the spirit um, um, and this explains right the 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 mediatorship here of christ explains the second person's role in this there's a one thing um on page 732 I think it's just, again, this sort of Chalcedonian language. So uh, near the bottom of the first full paragraph, right above where 1 Corinthians one thirty is cited. Yep. He says this, um, for since God, for the preservation, preservation of righteousness, renews those whom he freely reckons as righteous, 
Osiander mixes that, that gift of regeneration with this free acceptance and contends that they are one and the same. Mm-hmm. Yet scripture, even though it joins them, still lists them separately in order that God's manifold grace may better appear to us. Mm-hmm. So he has a word mix and join, which yeah. I find fascinating again. Uh, that's just, it's that Chalcedonian syntax applied in, in scholastic ways, meaning we distinguish, we don't... Yeah. Um, what is it? We don't separate, we distinguish. Yeah. So they're joined, basically regeneration, justification, but you can distinguish them between uh, as scripture does. I, so, theological distinctions or scholastic distinctions, I have long now been convinced that they are absolutely fundamental to our understanding of right. right. And distinction does not mean not joined yeah, together. It's not a separation, it's a distinction between these things to help the mind understand and categorize. So, and, and maybe even to say something, it's not controversial, but just straightforwardly, like, Justification and sanctification are joined. Yeah, <laughs> like right. they're not these two things far apart. Right. They're the effects of union with Christ. Yep. And you distinguish them mentally merely to understand what they are according to their own pattern is found in scripture. Yeah. As Calvin says, I think he's right. Justification declares us just remission of sins and imputes the righteousness of Christ to us. Sanctification is, well, he calls it regeneration too, but is that gradual renewal of making good on that claim, yeah. you know, in us by union with Christ, by the spirit. Yeah. It's amazing how many, especially since, you know, the, the idea of scholastic thought has faded in Protestant theology, particularly, uh, and especially evangelicalism, we get so muddled up in our theology because we don't know how to make the distinctions. There's a really good, right. essay. in fact, it might even be worth putting in the show notes yep. by a guy named Willem van Esselt, uh, who died a number of years ago. He taught at Utrecht University. And he has a really great study of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a theologian named Johannes Macovius. Mm. And Macovius did a really cool book. I have it. You can buy it from the University of Appledorn. Um, uh, it's called, I think it's just called Scholastic Distinctions. And he just goes through them all. And it's just, it's like a little systematic theology, all based on distinctions. And Van Essel, it's in the Westminster Theological Journal, I could give you a link to it, explains exactly why this is so important, you know, and Calvin's doing it here. He's not going to be as grand as some of the other Reformed theologians like Vermeule or something, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, he's doing it, you know. Well, even on page 739, he talks about, uh, yet we must bear in mind what I've, what I've already said, that the grace of justification is not separated from regeneration, although they they are distinct. <laughs> so it's like, okay, he's doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I think maybe we can just maybe jump on one thing and on near the end of the section, 753. Um, yeah, it's right at the end, uh, right before chapter 12 begins. 753, um, the second full paragraph, this is section 23. I think this is just a great summary. Yeah. You see that our righteousness is not in us, but in Christ, the person that we possess it only because we are partakers in Christ. The word in, 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 right? It's key. That's union language. It's Paul in Ephesians one. Indeed with him, we possess all its riches. So I, I think it's kind of massively important that, here it's so clear that righteousness whatever we have in terms of justification sanctification glorification regeneration all that that's all an effect of being a partaker of christ by the holy spirit yeah i I actually think in this section this chapter really there's no way to misread kelvin here i mean it's really clear on this in in more than at least two places so i i think it's just fascinating i think as you talked about earlier some of the dogmatic discussions we're having we have really lost the ability to distinguish theology. And therefore, when we hear someone talk different from us, we automatically assume that they've separated, not distinguished. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, and it's a massive problem. And it's why we call each other bad names sometimes, because John Piper can be talking about, you know, final justification or whatever. And then you have all these, you know, Theo bros <laughs> attacking a guy who's been a pastor for like, I don't know, like 40 years. Yeah, he might be wrong. He might disagree with him. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying uh, he's pretty good at making distinctions, actually, John Piper. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, and the other thing too, though, is not only like the importance of recognizing when somebody is making a distinction, uh, but sometimes we conflate terms, right? Mm-hmm. Like we'll actually use a term in a way, uh, and then assume that that uh, that's the only way it can be used without oh, yeah. recognizing a distinction in use of a particular term. 
And so then we get really confused by the way the language gets used because we think it's the same in each case when I actually know there's a distinction in uses here. And I think we see this in our circles. I I, uh, I talked, well, you know, about like a John Owen scholar recently uh, for a different podcast. And I mean, one of the things is John Owen has as a particular view of the justice of God, which is different than Calvin's view. Mm-hmm. And therefore, when you come to the doctrine of atonement, it's said a bit differently. It's not like night and day right. different or anything. There's no like huge problem there. But Calvin will say it differently. God, see, Calvin seems to say God can forgive uh, if he wants to. Yeah, Where Owen says God yeah. really needs to have Christ die to satisfy justice. Yeah. And I mean, that's fine. They're different. It's fine. It's not a big deal. <laughs> uh, but it's a real difference. Uh, it's a real distinction, rather. And uh, it's just important to realize. And if someone has a different view, they're not a heretic. <laughs> it's just yeah. like standard. It's the same idea, just differently applied. And yeah. I think it's important to realize that we can have some diversity within the big picture uh, tent of orthodoxy. Yeah. Yeah. The whole idea of di- theological diversity has been such a big issue in the last number of years because we sort of read the the tradition through the lens of some of the big names today, which are, you know, they're very helpful. Obviously, G.I. Packers are my heroes, yep. uh, Sproul, all Sproul. Guys, right? So they'll give you this, they'll give you this, this very helpful line at a kind of popular general level to just get people thinking these ways. But then as you kind of move beyond that and dig into the sources, you're like, oh, there's way more diversity. <laughs> Like Dr. Haken and Mark Jones edited two books on theological diversity. Um, you know, I contributed a chapter in the second volume and uh, you just read through the chapters of those two books. And you're like, wow, like there is a range of, 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 uh, of viewpoints all within the broad reform tradition. Yeah. Um, nothing, you know, excludes one necessarily, but uh, nevertheless, like that, that diversity, I think right. is really helpful to see because we get very, very rigid with it. This is where also like that push towards, you know, the idea of irenic theology, yeah. being really able to understand a person on their own terms, not trying to conflate all this other stuff or put all this other stuff into them. It's really, it's honest and it's really, it's, it's more helpful. Yeah. And with that, the idea of reformed Catholicity, I mean, yeah. you can be reformed and like, you can be Lutheran, Anglican, broadly um, uh, Protestant. I mean, even the. I, I'm sorry. This is this is a whole side thing, but just kind of reading Reformed history, yeah. there's a, a massive diversity across the different regions, right? Because it was yeah. very state led, and uh, generally they were all able to work together. Uh, and well, yeah. the 17th century had some issues, and. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's actually and, one of the things to note about Calvin, though. Is yeah. He's very much the guy that's trying to keep. He, as as things are starting to pull apart, he's trying to pull them back together. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, and he's got, right, like even here, I'm looking at, you know, on page 748 uh, under 19, right? Like he is like, he's he's got his, his Protestant reformational bona fides here when he's talking about justification by faith alone, yeah. right? Uh, he's using the language of sola fide, Paul, Paul, Romans 3. You know, the reader sees how fairly the sophists today cav- cavil against our doctrine when we say that man is justified by faith alone. And, uh, and he goes on to this whole discussion of like, you know, one of the solos of the Reformation, apart from works of the yeah. law. Um, so you, there's this core, but within that core, then there's that, that broader range of diversity that we have to, we have to recognize, yeah. and not, not just stick our heads in the sand with it. Well, I think we can maybe uh, dial it in for today. That was good. That's helpful. We got caught up a little bit. Uh, we okay. finished here on chapter 11, and that means next week, I believe, is it, I think it's chapters 12 to 14 uh yeah 12 to 14 so they must be short chapters and uh we're getting close to finishing book three and so we can get to your favorite, your favorite book four yeah and we'll wax eloquent on uh civil obedience and disobedience and political theology and offend everybody and before that what is the church what are the sacraments like all that okay. stuff is like super helpful you know um yeah this, this, uh, yeah this is where you get into some really cool stuff with calvin Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it. We'll see. Hey, maybe we'll become Pado Baptist if we read him on this. So, something's going to happen. <laughs> All right. See you next time. See ya.